working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everyone, Zach Albetta here with another episode of Working Drummer Podcast, and this week I'm pleased to introduce you to another Atlanta drummer, Darren Stanley. Darren has lived here all his life and played with just about everyone of any consequence in the Southeast, including Delta Moon and for the last few years with Colonel Bruce Hampton. Colonel Bruce is quite a cult hero in the music world who combines southern rock and blues with Zappa-like exploration, experimentation, and improvisation. Darren is also the percussion instructor at Brookwood High School, which is one of the largest and most well-known music programs in the state. This episode is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern almighty Japanese Birch Recording Kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legend Eddie Bayers, the Smashing Pumpkins' Jimmy Chamberlain, and Tedeschi Trucks Band's J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. That website, again, is sakaedrums.com. So in this interview, of course, Darren and I talk a lot about what we do, but uh, this is also a great conversation about the why. He really has a clear sense of what his purpose as a musician is. Uh, It's really great to listen to. So here we go, Darren Stanley. So how long have you been riding the drum chair for Colonel Bruce? God, with Bruce, it's been uh, three years now, which... In dog years is twenty one years, and in Bruce years, Bruce years it's about thirty three years, <laughs> thirty four years. Um, so we're getting along pretty well, right? Right. So Colonel, talk about Colonel Bruce Hampton and and his sort of <laughs> place in, uh, in in southern music and. Uh, I mean, I kind of saw what I thought I was gonna get into, but then. Things happen. I've seen things, man. <laughs> we've go, we've walked into to to hotel rooms in Idaho. First time I I've, I had to room with them, and we walk into the hotel room. There's no windows in the hotel room. We wake up the next morning, and there's four hotel rooms. There's four windows in the room. People are walking on our backs in the middle of the night, but nobody's there. It's insane. Wait, oh, wait, back up. <laughs> Uh, with, with Bruce, it's, um, it's, it's always a mind blower. Um, riding in the van, time stops. Uh, it's, it, it's incredible. There is no man, uh, that's, that's, uh, that can put twists and turns on things and make an experience out of nothing. (laughs) It's incredible. Yeah. It, it seems like being around him is is just an environment uh, ripe for um, uh, weirdness and yeah. sort of uh, mystic um, um, phenomena. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what he is is, I mean, he's one of the best improv artists I've ever worked with. You know, playing playing jazz, coming up, all these things, people that can improvise on their instrument, but he improvises. Anywhere and everywhere he goes. Yes. When he sits down and talks to somebody, it's an improv session, you know, and that kind of sets him up for when he's on stage. Right. Those types of things happen. Right. You know? It's um, amazing. I, my first experience with him, I've only met him once, actually. Um, <laughs> But mm-hmm. I, I had been I had been sort of warned about you know the the sort of shaman nature of of <laughs> Colonel Bruce and people were like dude he's gonna see something about you he's gonna guess your sign or he's gonna know your birth date or something and uh, Jacob Deaton our friend introduced me to him and I think Jacob had already told Bruce that I, I had moved here from L A so like he knew I was from L A uh-huh. but I met him and I shook his hand I, I said it's great to meet you Bruce he, and he looked at me and said I've seen you before. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, where? And he said, Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> and I lived a block off of Wilshire in L.A. Um, yeah. But, like, I've, I've heard other stories where, you know, Colonel Bruce sees him for the first time and says, come here, Aquarius. Like, he can just see her. <laughs> Man, um, you know, I, my first rehearsal with him, 
He walks in, and okay, to go back a little bit on Bruce, um, I was 19 years old, uh, my roommate in college brings back uh, an album, two albums. He had gone home to Augusta and uh, had seen uh, the Aquarium Rescue Unit with a band called Squat opening up for him. Right. And um, uh, go forward a couple years, I ended up playing with Squat in Athens and then <laughs> playing with Bruce <laughs> in, in Atlanta, which is weird. Uh, but we, we, we get we get the hold of those albums, and I'd never heard anything like that. You know, I was 19 years old, and Aquarium Rescue Unit was just, what is this? I mean, it's 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 jazz improv, improvisation, but with bluegrass and rock and roll and Yeah, somebody and told me it was... Latin music. Somebody and, told me it was like if, if Zappa joined Skinner. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that, that, that's it. So, uh, you know, to have... And, and all those guys in those bands, if you're not aware of Colonel Bruce Hampton and the Aquarium Rescue Unit, go uh, dig that stuff up. The live album at the Georgia Theater is incredible. Mm-hmm. Jeff Sipe on drums, uh, Jimmy Herring on guitar, O'Teal Burbridge, uh, Matt Mundy playing mandolin. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, those guys were, were living that lifestyle. They were doing 250, 300 dates a year, yeah. you know. And, and it sounded like it. You know? <laughs> and they were all, at that time, they were 22, 23 years old. Mm-hmm. The, and and Bruce, Bruce was older, he was 42. Um, but, uh, yeah, to, to, to hear that and, and, the, and, and to kind of seek him out as much as I could and, and see him live. And then years later, um, uh, to get a call from him and... And him want me to come play, and I was terrified, man. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 34, 33, 34, and just like a 19 year old again. Like, right. Oh God, right. Not nice to meet you. And, and didn't didn't know, you know, we'd get in the van, and he just goes off on these tangents. I'm going, what is happening? <laughs> I don't, I can't, I can't see which way's up. And <laughs> so it's it's been an experience. And the more, you know, over the three years, you know, I've uh, come to kind of know know the guy, and it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Right. So after a while, you're able to kind of uh, uh, you know parse the uh, the serious from the absurd, right? And you can tell when he's screwing with somebody, and you know, <laughs> when he really wants to be listened to. Uh-huh. Um, so talk about that that gig uh, musically. Like what 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 does the drum chair entail? The man the drum the drum chair entails holding it down because uh, there's a lot that can go on and a lot that can happen and it, it, you know about the, the five t's if you need to go check out his um his documentary okay uh the musical madness of colonel bruce hampton okay and and again uh you know i was only aware of aquarium rescue unit when i joined him and then he, he gave me the documentary it first came out when i first started playing with him and uh watched that and had no idea there were there were five or six other great bands Mm -hmm. that he had, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And, you know, it was the, the, the amount of insanity that went on when he was younger, but the older that he's gotten, he really wants that, um, that fat bottom to go on in, in the rhythm section. Right. So, so holding it down and we'll play, you know, we'll play these simple one, two chord jams that go on for eight, nine minutes. Mm -hmm. But, Guess what the drums are going to do? Nothing. Nothing. I'm not going to do anything. You got to be know? the voice of reason, the, right? The and constant. The, the, uh, but but he he has the he he has the five T's that he talks about in the documentary: um, tone, touch, technique, taste, and the threat of vomit. <laughs> and the threat of vomit can it, it, it vomit can always happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it can happen. And it. <laughs> And when it does, though, you know, I still have to know vomit's happening. I'm still going to hold down, you know, just 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 keep the groove going and let everything sit on top of that. Right. And and like in musical terms, that's just sort of like <laughs> an expulsion of, yeah. you know, an explosion of, of what regurgitating right? your dinner on your instrument. Not not, you know, metaphorically speaking. I mean, you right. just, it's it's just it's all that pent up energy and aggression that you have from the week, you know, the things that go on in your day-to-day life, right. all that stuff's just... Blah, in, involuntarily. <laughs> yeah, involuntarily. <laughs> There's no thought. There. It's not like, I'm going to play this nice line right now. It's That's not just, any of that. It's just... Got to get it it's out. It's a release. <laughs> it's a total release. Oh, man. Okay. Um, 
So, so you mentioned college. We'll go back. So you you went to uh, UGA, right? Yeah. Um, and I know I've talked to a couple other people that went there, Marlin, and mm-hmm. um, so, but like you know, Athens is a, a just a cool town to be a musician, especially to be a young musician. Yeah. Um, so talk about how you kind of balanced your school experience with with the Athens wow. experience. Uh, you know that 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 kind of just. Uh, happened on its own Mm -hmm. um you know uh being in in the music in the music department there um playing in the jazz band a guy named steve dance um headed up headed up the jazz band yeah i think marlon mentioned him yeah and he um you know he was kind of the reason for a band that was um that was doing pretty well at the time in athens uh, a band named squat Mm -hmm. uh they had been together together at that point maybe eight or nine years um and and so you know hanging out with steve and then going to their uh those guys gigs um trey wright uh tommy somerville and 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 carl Mm limberg and at at that point Dwayne holloway who's a great drummer just moved back to atlanta um and he was he was playing drums at the time uh and, and then through through those guys um you know Dwayne moved away to New York and uh just the, the drum chair came open and and that was the first like okay we're getting in a van and we're we're we're, we're going right. you know we're, we're leaving for the weekend um and though you know pl- playing playing with that group kind of got me out into the Athens music scene a little bit mm-hmm. um there, there there were there were there were some other bands um also, when I actually when I first moved to Athens, um, my one of my best friends from high school was playing trombone in a swing band mm-hmm. at the time. And in like the '90s, the not '96, '97, the swing band, the Cherry Pop and Daddies, and stuff like that. Was yeah, coming yeah. Back. I, I played in a band in L.A. with the the founding member of Royal Crown Review. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So and that, that yeah. stuff was like kind of hitting at the time. Yeah. In, in the college towns. Right. Um, so we, uh, you know, at, at the same time, again, that, that the drummer that was playing in that band was moving out of town. I was moving in town and, and started playing with a band called Six Shades Blue, which, uh, I mean, it, 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 it pulled in a, a lot of people into, into the Georgia Theater, the 40 Watt. My first gig in Athens was at the 40 Watt, you know, it was like, okay, I'm here. I kind of took it for granted because yeah. it was like, okay, that's, that's how things work. Uh, it was just a little bit of luck, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I did not realize. And again, you take things for granted when you're in immersed in those scenes. But um, to be around so much music, you know, a- Athens is a different scene from Atlanta, uh, very much. And 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 you know, the whole study of like, there's people that are are musicians and they're in college and they they really they're great at their instrument. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side of things, you know, there's bands that, you know, that live together and, and kind of breathe the whole thing together and develop this thing. And not necessarily great players, you know, not Uh the, not the best players at their instrument, but they create a sound as a group. Right. And Athens had a lot of that, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, a lot of bands and, Groups with sounds, you know, yeah. and not 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 you just didn't go out and just hear killing. Oh man, this is great great players, a bunch of great players on stage. But right. like, hey, that's that band that I love. You know, yeah. you know, a bunch of bunch of people loving bands. Yeah. Oh, I got this band CD. You know, right? It was um yeah, it was it, it it was it was a good place to come up. Yeah, and I realize the older I get, like man, we was lucky. You know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Um, so you didn't you didn't march core, but you did march. In at at UGA, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. Did you do snare or tenors or what? Yeah, it, okay. played snare drum. Okay, so is that where these hands came from? Uh, yeah. You just have monstrous it, like muscular hands. It, uh, it's it, it, yeah. I guess I guess so. It's a little bit of insanity just playing on. I'll I'll, I'll never forget the the day though that you know like it uh, uh, senior in high school and. Playing on playing on a drum pad, it was like playing on a drum pad a lot back in those days, mm-hmm. and like the drum set was kind of sitting to the side a little bit. I remember my mom walking in and goes, "What do you think you're ever gonna do with that?" 
you know, you should play the drum kit. That'll take you further. I'm like, Mom, you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is one of those moments that sticks with you. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, um, the, 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 that thing, like, I was really into just rudimental drumming yeah. for a long time. I mean, the older, you know, the older that we get, you, you, I've, I've gotten away from that a little bit, but try to still just maintain playing simple things on, on a drum pad. Yeah, I can, I can tell. I mean, you're, uh, you know, you're obviously not a rudimental drummer anymore, but when, when I see you play, there's just, there's, I mean, there's a precision, first of all, time-wise, and just I can tell, like, where you're hitting on the hi-hat and where you're hitting on the snare, it's just, like, it's the same every stroke. Right. And, and you have a, um, a consistency and a speed and a strength that, that I uh, envy. Because I'm I'm at a point in in my playing now where I'm trying to muscle up and I'm trying to develop right. you know some more stamina and some more speed. My my whole background is jazz, so you know I've been more focused on sort of touch and finesse and all that stuff. But sure. how how have you maintained uh, your hands in such great shape over the years? Uh, man, I think that's I think that just comes from just doing it. Yeah, you know, there's no I don't think there's a secret. Um, it it just just comes from really just just putting the work in and and you know I, I, I like to all right so um, be, before we had the two kids you know now we've, uh, <laughs> my wife and I have two kids and there's less time um, day to day yeah uh, before you know back before the kids and I, man there was a there was a, a time where I was able to practice a lot and I started off the day doing two hours on the practice pad Wow. And just an hour of that was like, um, I'd turn the metronome on triplets, play flam accents, flam taps, and I'd start it at this tempo, and I'd go to this tempo yeah. every day. And, and then uh, the other hour, just turn on the metronome on 16th notes, you know, groups of threes, groups of fours. There's, you know, that, that you really need to know those things. Yeah. Um, and just playing like uh, that singles, doubles, paradiddles exercise, just stick control stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, start that at like 160, start it at 160 and, and get it going to 210, 2, 220 um, when it was really cooking, you know. And, and that when, when I had those hands together, you get you, you don't have to worry about the physical part of drumming. Yeah. When you go to do it, you could just, you can just tap into the musical side and really listen. You're not, you're not, you're not having to dig hard for anything. Right. You know, it's, it's all like, it's all at your fingertips. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think, you know, with, with drumming, I think there's the three things or, or, or with, with, with any musical, you know, uh, instrument, there's, there's three things. There's the physical part, there's the mental part mm -hmm. and there's a spiritual part, you know, and I think all those three things kind of need to be in balance and to, you know, to kind of keep a, I don't know, it's, it, it's just all three of those things need to be there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Especially for improvisational music, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. The word around town about you, like when I first got here, I saw you play a few times and I, you know, I saw you play in a few different contexts and um, I didn't know anything about your background and I just asked a couple other drummers like, where, cause I saw you do the, the, the 51 jam, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about that in a second, but you know, <laughs> super improvisational, open, whatever. But like, I saw your technique and just your freedom on the kit. And I asked a couple people like, where did this come from? What has this guy been doing? And everybody was like, new breed. Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I man, I think that's one of the best kept secrets. I don't know a lot of people that the first book, not so much. The second book, I don't know many folks that have dug in on that. I know a lot who have dug in on the first one. Yeah, but, but the not, first one, not the second one. Uh, the second one. Okay, so um, man, when I, when I was in, when, I, when I was in high school. Uh, my private teacher got me in on, on new breed and I just did so much on that. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really see the big picture and see what, what we could get. And, and it helped, helped develop some, some, some things. Uh, but then fast forward to college and, uh, Marlon Patton, who you said you had, you guys had on the, on the podcast yeah. a couple weeks ago. Um, we were rooming together and you he, roomed with Marlon. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, man. wait, yeah, they're uh, downstairs, drum room A, drum room B. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> too much too much noise. Oh, but, uh, to be a fly on the wall in that house. <laughs> oh, no, we won't get into all that. But, uh, um, but yeah, uh, I, you know, he, he, he had... Um, he had the cojones to get that second book and to dig in on it. And I remember like listening to some of those things just from outside of the room going, why would you ever play that? Right. Like what? It, it just sounded like a run on sentence right. to me. You know, there was no musical, anything just went, huh, that is strange, but let it go. Two months later, we're doing a, a co bill show in Athens. Uh, and his band's playing Gunnison, which was a great, great band. Uh, they're playing, and he just had this moment, and I went, holy cow, the amount of freedom yeah. that was all of a sudden there. The amount of freedom, I went, wow, there might be something to it. So started started digging in. Um, started digging in on the, on the second New Breed book, and it took uh, a good four months for me to feel any difference. Mm-hmm. Um and it take it takes a lot of patience and uh, kind of a little bit of a leap of faith. Like, mm-hmm. okay, this uh, this you know, uh, I've been told that this can do something for me. It's it's huge, man. Yeah. Um, and it's not about um, that. That's not like a chop builder book. That's that's, <laughs> no. a, that's a book about um, just it's, being able to execute sort of any orchestration, any voice in in any way. It's it does a lot of things. One thing that it does do, because you're playing at 60 BPM, you know, mm. the whole book is 60. You're playing everything at 60. Um, it You gain so much control yeah. over every limb. Okay, so the thing that the book has you do um, is... This you is New to, Breed 2. This is New Breed 2. Okay. Um, the first thing with each of these exercises... Um, and, and the way that, you know, okay, the hands are broken up in such a way where the left hand hits on every part of the 16th. Mm -hmm. Okay. In a measure. Uh, and then you've got the right hand filling that in, maybe the hi-hat playing upbeats. And then the bass drum is the melody part. That's the part that's going to move. Uh, Uh, you have those warmups that play a real simple exercise on the melody page and, you know, the way that the bass drum moves around, you've got to go through and you sing the quarter note. Okay, so all these things are moving around, but you're putting all your energy on where the downbeat is, right. where the chord note is. Right. Then you've got to go through, sing the right hand, sing the left hand, sing the foot, or sing the bass drum, sing the hi-hat. And you're doing all that against all these other three parts. Now, what, what that did when I first got into this and I started, okay, now I'm going to go sing the left hand. Um, all of a sudden my brain would hear the whole pattern would just flip and I'd hear it backwards and go, whoa, whoa, did I just change what I'm playing? And I realized, no, I'm just hearing everything from that perspective, right? From that part of the beat, I'm hearing everything fit around it that way. And, um, you know, the, the book does not work on certain styles, Mm -hmm. you know, but it, 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 it gives you the freedom and, and the control to once you go back and you play those certain styles, everything, man, it's like, ooh, that, that sits yeah, yeah. a little better. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's, it, it's a monster, man. You, you really have to, there's one or two other drummers have turned on in Atlanta to the second New Breed book mm-hmm. that have taken it on. And probably two, three months later, I'll get a message and go, Hey, I, th- I think I, I can see the difference. Yeah. It's like, okay, who, keep at it. Who, who else is doing uh, A guy named N- Nico Limbo. Oh, yeah, Nico. He, um, really was curious about it uh-huh. and uh, uh, got into it. And a couple of my students up at, up at the high school, yeah, um, yeah. I've got them started in <laughs> high school. Just they're, they're guinea pigs. Right. <laughs> let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. Plant these let's, seeds. let's see the effect on minors. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Nobody under eighteen should. Uh... <laughs> oh man, that's great. And the fact that the fact that it's all at sixty BPM, like, is yeah. just is beautiful and terrifying. Um, yeah. Because uh, you know, it's, I think my tendency is like a lot of drummers. Like, as soon as anything gets in any way comfortable, I want to speed it up. Right. Um, but you re- just, you really 
can't. <laughs> it's the, the stuff is so hard, and that, that's the thing about this book is I, I, I ever you know it's I probably started it ten years ago, and I still go back. I'm, I'm there's a certain section I'm working on right now, and you go back to these sections, and it's not like yeah I got this. It's like whoa I'm reduced back to starting. You're not starting over, but it's still it takes time to work these things up. Right, you know. Um, yeah, and it just it helps with every style. It helps with um, internalizing the metronome. I mean, do you feel like you have when you play the drums? Do you have a leading limb when you yeah. play? Yeah, yeah, it's right hand. The right hand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 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 how I always felt too. Mm-hmm. And when, when I get really deep into this book, uh, I mean, it, it it takes a minute. It's like every day, put in some time every day, and go out on these gigs two, three weeks later the metronome is 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 coming from the center right and and all of these you know your limbs you can play around that metronome which is in the center which yeah. is in in really internalized right you know? and i would imagine like playing that stuff at 60 uh has a, a physical effect too on mm-hmm. just your your balance and your center of gravity behind the kit yeah um which is a, like, another thing i notice about your playing you sit you sit fairly low i think for a tall guy um, and, and yeah, like when you, when you mention that and kind of demonstrate that, that your, your center of gravity is like in your solar plexus, like I think of you playing and it makes, it makes total sense Yep. because your limbs, your limbs have freedom around the center. It's not just freedom in relation to each other. It's freedom around right. the center. Right. It's, uh, and I heard, uh, Steve Smith in a, in a clinic put it, it's, it's not, it's not independence. It's interdependence. Yeah. yeah, they're, yeah. they're all dependent on each other. And and the, the 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 new breed stuff, you're working on so many patterns at one time. Right. There's so many patterns going on. Yeah. And 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 it really takes a minute to sing each one and start. You know, once you get great at 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 playing just the the warm up exercises, like you go to sing the right hand, and I'll be singing the right hand, but okay, I'm going to listen to the bass drum and see how that fits in the right hand, mm-hmm. or I'm going to listen to the left hand and see how that fits in with the right hand, or I'm going to listen to the hi hat. How does that fit with that? Mm-hmm. Are they landing together? Are they, you know, are they are they complementing each other? Right. Or are they rubbing against each other? Right. And I was I was going to ask like how this applies to. I mean, it's obvious how this would apply to like a super improvisational uh, context. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and people might wonder how it, it would apply to a really straight ahead context where mm. you're just playing two and four and oh. laying it down and whatever. Right. But if like, if you recalibrate all your limbs to sort of, uh, um, be interdependent, then even the simplest oh, pattern, yeah. even the simplest groove is going to feel different Absolutely. And, and feel more cohesive and solid. There's, there's a, there's a couple of those exercises where you're, everything's really open and like your right hand, you know, the ride cymbal hands playing the upbeat, mm-hmm. right? But then with new breed, everything that you do, you know, it's, you're playing the, the, the lead with the right hand. The next exercise, you're going to be playing the lead with the left hand. Mm-hmm. So you're playing the upbeat in that left hand, which I usually put on the snare drum. So you're playing an upbeat at 60. Bah, bah, bah. It's just a backbeat. Bah, bah. And right. then playing all this stuff around it. So, you know, I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing that upbeat on the snare drum, which at 120 could be the backbeat. Right. And you can work on that. Man, is that right on, is that right on two and four? Yeah. Like you can, you really gain the control of like, when you want to hit it, it's going to hit. So I, I did a little bit of, of new breed one, like years and years ago. And, and when the limbs switched, I would also switch the instrumentation or in other words sure. I, I wouldn't switch the instrumentation so if you it was not. if it was right hand lead on the ride and then the next exercise was left hand lead i would i would do left hand on you know the left ride symbol sure. but you're yeah. saying just keep the limbs where they are that, that, I, I do that a lot yeah um i mean you can you can switch it up you're, you that that way you can still hear the same instrumentation mm-hmm. it mirrors each other you know if you do put your left hand on a ride cymbal and the right hand's on the snare drum it does the same thing i think but uh there, there there's there's something about staying here 
um, with the with the left hand on 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 the snare drum that I, I really like doing that. Well, it, it it makes even more sense to me because on on your average gig, like, right, you're you're not going to play left hand. Yeah, unless on you're the gonna, ride. Right. Like your left hand is going to stay on the snare. Your right hand is going to stay on the ride. Yeah, you know, like what what reason is there to play left hand lead on a Colonel Bruce gig? Right, <laughs> unless you're going to, you know, I mean, unless so unless that's do. part of your vomit thing. Yeah, but. a man, anything. <laughs> Whoa. Oh God! Oh, yeah, the threat of vomit—it could happen. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, it. Um, but it, it it did, and and the, and the thing, the new breed stuff too is is stick control. Mm-hmm. It's just all stick control. You know, you people work out of the stick control book, but you know, to get these exercises down, it takes so long to be able to get the stuff together that you're sitting there playing these stick control exercises for a really long time while you're trying to get your independence together. And it's like, dude, the amount of control, you know, you know, the feeling when you're driving down the road and, uh, in the old squat van, that, that band that <laughs> they used to play, uh, Carl Lindbergh was the bass player, man. And I'll never forget, like we're driving down this hill coming from Nash, uh, coming from Asheville. And like, there was a lot of play in the steering wheel. And he's, man, there feels like there's a bunch of jelly donuts between the steering wheel and the tires. <laughs> and when you're out of practice, do you not feel like there's a bunch of jelly donuts between your brain and your limb? Oh yeah. You know that, that yeah. feeling? So, you know, the, the new breed stuff again, like it, it, it kind of, it, it, the attachment between the brain and each limb yeah. is, you know, if you think it, that's what's coming out, mm. you know, it's, uh, it's amazing, but it takes so much time. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's the one, one thing. I think I'm, I'm just reaching the point in, in my life when I might have the maturity and the patience <laughs> to actually attack something like that. Um, do it. Yeah. Do it. Okay. I'm yeah. going to take the book with me when I go. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Marlon's uh, one guy that I know that has gone all the way through it, and you can tell. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 when I first started uh, that book, uh, I saw it was really into Keith Carlock at the time. It was in New York and um, ended up at the bar at the same time with him. I said, man, here's a nerdy drum question, but did you do any new breed too while you were in school? He was like, yeah. A- absolutely mm-hmm. sure did so like I, w- watching him and like how does he break up those things yeah you know the, the the way his style is very very unique the way that he breaks things up and 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 play those rhythms on the hi-hat um you know it just it started to occur to me man that seems like it could be you know some of the new breed two stuff yeah I have recently inherited a, a drum chair that you occupied for eight years. God, in, in, not now. <laughs> in Delta Moon. Yes. Um, and and as I understand it, uh, like you, when you started to play with Delta Moon, that was that kind of that kind of shook you out of your God. your jazz head yes. uh, tendencies. Mm-hmm. So talk about talk about that time in your in your life and that stage in your playing and and what playing in a roots rock blues band <laughs> did, <laughs> did to your brain you know uh be- before that you know like oh man was really into just the 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 jazz thing and especially the the the, the modern jazz drummer guys of the brian blades and the eric harlins and mm-hmm. the, you know the, the, that that stuff is and it's still mind-blowing yeah you know what they do they just weave this tapestry of sounds mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of where I, I wanted to go with it, you know, and and thought too. What well, was into the into jazz head that you know you you see the 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 rock and roll stuff and you see the and you go oh I can do that right. because I play I play jazz and I can do lots of you know uh, I can do that. But then at, at that time had an audition or two for some singer songwriter stuff and it didn't work out mm-hmm. because well a the, the pocket is not there, mm-hmm. okay, which we take for granted when we listen to a great pocket player. We can see the physicality of it and go, oh, that doesn't that doesn't look so hard, right. you know, and I, I can feel that rhythm while he's playing it, right. you know. Uh, so, and, and also the way that you hit, mm-hmm. the way that you hit is, is very important. Um, so, yeah, well, I'm starting to play with the Delta Moon guys and... Um, you know, they were at that time in my life, really being jazz. They did. They they gave me a chance. Mm-hmm. You know, 
uh, they could hear that something was there that they liked, but it needed to be developed. Um, so things that, you know, just simple things. Tom, uh, who's the, 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 the primary songwriter in the band and has been around. I mean, at, the, at that time, I think he was 57, 58 years old. Mm-hmm. He'd been around the music industry. He'd, he'd played in real working rock and roll bands. You know, mm-hmm. he'd been out there on the road and he knew what he wanted from a drummer. Hey, man, well, we just want you to crack the snare on two and four. I'm like, oh, yeah, two and four. I can do that. Sure. <laughs> man, you get to the gig and you just so much comes out. You know, you got all this, man, I got all this stuff, all this vocab in here, man. Oh, check out this hip thing. Check out that hip thing. Man, we just want you to hit the snare drum on two and four. (laughs) And I started to realize, wow, listening back, like listening back to recordings, like, okay, this, it takes a lot of restraint. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of control. Uh, it does. It takes a lot of power to yeah. be able to maintain, you know, that gig, play a 90 minute set with those guys. Right. Um, so, you know, trying to get rid of all the ghost notes, all the little in-betweens and just strip it down to just boom, bat, boom, bat, boom, bat, and do that for five minutes. Right. That's hard. Yeah. You know, um, so doing that over time, I mean, we were really for for a long time. We were we were on the road a good bit, and we were we were playing night after night and getting to kind of hone those things in. Um, another thing with them that I'd never done before was work on a studio album for a year and a half wow. with them. It took us a year and a half to do Hellbound Train. Wow! And. You know, we were over at, at, at Tom's place, which is now Jeff Bakos's next to the Variety right, right. Uh, Playhouse. Yeah. We were in that room. I mean, we just lived in there for, for, for a year and a half and learned so much from going in, recording the song. The first, the first song on, on Hellbound Train is the, is Hellbound, the, the, the tune Hellbound Train. Yeah. And it's just, the drum part is like, boom, pat, boom, boom. You know, just just that for for five minutes, right? And going in and recording that tune, okay, and then okay, let's li- three or four takes. Let's listen back. And I remember this one instance of we get to a certain part of the song. Man, I'm going to do this fill into this next section. It's kind of this hip thing, you know. And I played it. it was like it felt good when it went down. And then listening back, and we get to that part of the song, and all of a sudden, I was distracted from the song. Mm-hmm. I was distracted from the words. I was distracted from the groove, right. because this thing came kind of came out of nowhere yeah. and happened. Uh, and you know, just hearing that, learned, dude, don't do anything. Right. Stop trying to do anything and just 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 be part of the song. Yeah. Be part of the puzzle. Right. Um, and it is a puzzle. Like the way they construct songs. With the because it's two slide guitars and they interact in a certain way and then the bass and drums fit into that and it's it's kind of like you were talking about an interdependent sort of thing and they they all if one thing changes then something else has to change right you know right um, and and that, that's the thing in those bands they're coming up with riffs they're coming up with riff oriented parts yeah and then there may be a solo here where the guitar sits on top of everything else but th- it's that whole pyramid thing man. Yeah. Uh, the the bass and the drums are that big broad bass for everything to be able to sit on top of. And in Delta Moon, you have one of the greats uh, that doesn't do anything. Right. He doesn't know that he should do anything, which is beautiful. <laughs> that, that, that that bass player doesn't do anything. I won't say his name. Well, why not? I can't say his name. <laughs> if you he, say I can't he say. He shall not be named. I, he he <laughs> shall not be named. <laughs> Uh, Frainer Joseph. That's the man uh, does, <laughs> that never never does anything. And, yeah. and, and and as a drummer and getting to sit next to him and play with him every night, you realize, I don't have to. He just, the, the meters, uh, 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 George Porter Jr. said, Zigaboo is the dance, but I'm the dance floor. <laughs> and that's what Frainer is, man. Yeah. He is that bed where the drums can just dance on top of that floor. You yeah. Know? And so many, so many, you know, a lot of bass players, they think they're guitar players, mm. you know, 
And a lot of guitar players, they think they're saxophone players. <laughs> you know, they just, they just, it's just a run-on. Sax a run players on are the sense. worst. Well, they, 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 I'm glad there's none here right now. Well, you wouldn't let any in your house. No! <laughs> no. We know how to get them off the porch. <laughs> Pay them for the pizza. Uh, yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's just that, that Delta Moon was a study in learning how to play simply, learning to play for the song. Um, learning how to hit because you do have to hit with them because man those guitar amps every time you turn around somebody's turning it up <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, it is it's it's it's, it's fun so it's it's a good time and uh, you know to, to take those those lessons and try to bring them when I do play a jazz gig just play simple don't play anything yeah you know just 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 be the groove that sits underneath and wait for some idea to come. Right. Don't don't just that. Right. Here's here's what I've been working on in the shed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The shed, man. <laughs> it's funny. My um, in the last couple of years, my my approach to jazz has changed because you know I as a, a student in grad school, you're just constantly working on on your vocabulary, on your jazz vocabulary, and and you get on the gig and you want to get it out. You know, everybody wants to get it out. Sure. Um, but <laughs> I, um, I've, I've just been approaching it more, more like a rock gig, just play time, yeah. just play time. And, and, and if something comes up that you right. want to interact with or comment on or whatever, then, then by all means, but, um, I've, I've just sort of given up on, um, trying to get my vocabulary out and, and trying to sure develop you know, new and, and interesting vocabulary because it, it always leads to just sort of regret. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I, I play it, like in the moment it feels good and then you listen back or you, you see the reaction of somebody and you're like, nope, that wasn't yep. what I, you know. It reminded me when you were talking about that fill you did in the studio a few years ago, I realized, whether in the jazz context or the rock context or whatever, I realized, I, I look back at, at all the drumming I've ever done and I have regretted playing a fill a, a lot more often than I have regretted not playing one. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Um, it, it, it's 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 funny, man. It's, it's and and it's the same thing with um, with the other players in the band. It's like you you know you want the drummer to hold it down. Everybody hold it down, mm-hmm. and it will sound bigger and better if everybody's playing a part of the puzzle. And not trying to stand out. Right. You know. Right. And that's the thing about a band like Delta Moon is that right. everybody holds it down. Right. There is no, there is not a star in that band. Like no. the lyrics are, are you know, front and center. Mm-hmm. Um, but even, even Tom as a singer is not a, a, a showy dude. Like right. he's, you know, he sings the lyrics. He doesn't put a bunch of ornamentation on stuff. It's no. everything is just simple. And you take a, you know, those simple ingredients and they, they combine to form just like a lean and mean, uh, you know, complete sound. Like you were talking about the bands in, in Athens, there's a band sound, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like, Oh, that one player is so amazing. Oh, that it's like, I love that band, man. The, the, uh, have you checked out that Steve Jordan video? No. The, the one that he put out. And th- that's another thing, like it, it, drummers. Like you ask drummers, you know, who's your, who do you listen to? Who's your favorite? Vinny, mm-hmm. you know, Gad, of course. Yeah. Um, there's the occasional Weckle that's still in there. Right. Cool. Steve Smith. Steve, you know, all the, the, the drum heroes, mm-hmm. right? No, no, nobody says, oh, uh, you will go up to a drummer. Oh, LaVon. Right. Steve Jordan, you know, Charlie Watts, mm-hmm. um, dudes, uh, I mean, Qu- Questlove right. holds it down. Jim Keltner. Jim Keltner, J.D. Blair. Right. You know, seeing seeing that stuff, you start growing up and you go, man, I could not stop dancing all night. Um, the, a, another good thing about coming up in Athens was getting to see the national acts that came through mm-hmm. and going, you know, back in when I was really into jazz, jazz head days and going to the Georgia theater and seeing Maceo Parker's band. And that drummer all night went and the bass player, you know, nobody, everybody was playing a part of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. It was all part of the puzzle, but 
dude, uh, a a a a room full of college kids that could not stop moving. I had blisters on my feet the the the, the next morning. Yeah, and just went. Wow, what just happened? Right. You know, I wasn't there going, man, look at what that drummer is doing. Look at look at what oh, look at what that guitar player just played some amazing line. Um it was about a tone and and feel and and vibe. Yeah. Uh and one of the great quotes I've ever heard was a a good a good musician makes the audience think about them. But a great musician makes the audience think about themselves mm. and go, you know, think about their own lives, mm-hmm. and and that 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 that's like, yeah, I I I could, I can I can dig that. Yeah. So many people want to try to stand out. Yeah. You know, if they want to make it. Right. Yeah, I got to stand out and look great. But yeah. Man, it's uh, it's deeper than that. Yeah. You know, this music thing is a lot. It's not about us. It's not about our egos mm-hmm. feeding that. It's uh, it's about a higher calling, man. <laughs> you have been hanging out with Bruce. God. <laughs> Let's talk about the Fifty One and okay. and Elliott Street because you've you've been at the at the center of kind of one of the great creative incubators in Atlanta mm-hmm. for a while. Um, so the uh, Elliott Street Pub uh, has a weekly jam session on Tuesday night. It's led by Kevin Scott, bassist, and more often than not, you're the house drummer. Um, and that's been going on for how long? Uh, well, he is on his, gosh, is he going into his 10th year? I think maybe, yeah. Nine, uh, this September, it's either nine or 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and when he first started it, he had taken over the Tuesday night jam session at a place called the Five Spot. Right. In Little Five Points. Which is now Aisle Five. Which is now Aisle Five. Okay. Um, he had taken over that jam session. Kept it going, and I mean, I, I went down to that Tuesday session at the Five Spot a couple of times, and did the house drummer thing a couple of times. Um, the the for me the thing was uh, you leave your drum set set up, and the jam goes until three thirty or four, you know. Um, and as a, a a married man with kids, I went, man, <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I can't, I can't keep doing this, uh, you know. But it was amazing to go down there and still it had the same, that same free spirit, and 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 maybe more so because the bar was right there. It was all intertwined, and and to see the, I mean, just a bunch of degenerates, man, <laughs> just a bunch of cra- the craziest, weirdest, most eclectic. Uh, people in the music scene, right? Um, and this is the thing about that jam. It's not a jazz jam. It's not a blues jam, mm-hmm. or an R and B, or you know, like a singer jam, or whatever. It's all comers. Yeah, come one, come all. Bring your shit. Bring your instruments. Bring your crazy. And everybody just gets thrown in together. Yes. And some weeks it's magic, and uh-huh. some weeks it's a shit show. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. It, it, and and it's not a it's not a thing of hey man I've been working on this thing in 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 the shed right. and now I'm gonna like bring it out and play it on stage. It is every we we, we are trying to figure out things together in that moment mm-hmm. and like. You know, that's the beautiful thing about play, playing with, with Kevin on a week-to-week basis. I never... He plays how he feels in that moment. Mm-hmm. That's what that Tuesday can do. And I never hear him play, regurgitate something. Right. From another, it just... It, it just it, and, and to be able to hear this thing for the first time and to make logical sense out of it and to make to try to make something into it is the challenge, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and add guitars to that and add a quote unquote keyboard player, whatever it is that's going on over there. Right. Or pedal steel or whatever. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the instrument, the instrumentation is, is, is pretty different, uh, weekly, but to, you know, it's just that, that quest to try, um, to just, just be in the moment and listen to each other and, True democracy. You know? <laughs> um, it's um, it, it it it's it is it's fascinating, and we we are probably on to something twenty seven percent of the time, <laughs> and the rest of the time is just is the search, right? You know, right? 
Um, and sometimes the search leads somewhere, and sometimes yeah. it, it leads nowhere. Right, and and it go it goes back to the you know all all these things in this group of people kind of lead back to Bruce, mm-hmm. and it's that thing of you know his whole thing of man, uh, I'm tired. I don't want to go here. Good. I don't want to pay seventy nine eighty five to go hear somebody play good. Mm. You know, dribble a basketball. God, dump a jar of mayonnaise on your keyboard. It just, <laughs> it, it, it just, it, you know, it, it gets back to uh, th- th- that's the thing. We're getting further and further away from this art thing. You know, what is music? Well, it's art. Well, is life always good? Mm-hmm. You know, do you always feel good? No. Sometimes you feel like a bag of uh, uh, just you feel terrible. Right. Play terrible sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's okay. It, 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 it's okay to just get these things out and and to to get this attachment to the others that you're playing around. Right. I think it's it's the difference between you know viewing a musical performance as you know one one party delivering a performance and the right. other party consuming it. Yep. Versus uh, just making it more of a collective experience between performers and listeners, mm-hmm. um, uh, rather than a, a product. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's not a product. If you can sit through that on a Tuesday, you're insane. All of you people that come and sit, I just go, holy cow! <laughs> it's, it's funny, um, but yeah, it's 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 been a great vehicle to just explore and and play with some weirdos, man. Yeah. The guys that come down there are just all out of their gourds, and they're, they're, they're everybody's a little broken in some sense, and mm-hmm. it's. You know, it's not going and, and dressing up and saying the right hip thing to each other. And here's my business card. And blah, it's right. it's right. It's it's down in the dirt, man. But it's not like I've I've noticed it's not just it's not just crazies who come out of the woodwork. Right. Like, there no. are some crazies who come out of the woodwork, but like you know, the workingest dudes in town. Yeah, make regular appearances there, mm-hmm. and and people who are touring through town get wind of that oh, and yeah. either they know Kevin or somebody you know is recommend like if you're in Atlanta go check out this jam mm-hmm. um, so you know it's a, it's a destination for, yep. for people in, in the sense of it being an experience like you talked about <laughs> it is I, I when, when I first uh, when I uh, was thinking about man I, I kind of want to start playing up there again playing with Kevin uh, on Tuesdays go up and, and check it out and just sit in front of that band and just, man, it was an experience. You know, it took you out of um, your situation at the time, the, re- reali- the reality of day-to-day life, and just to, just to really go and listen to those things that are happening. It's just like, wow, man. It's, um, it's weird. Yeah. It's weird, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, thank goodness for that, 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 that Tuesday night jam at, at Elliott Street. Yeah. It's, it's huge for a lot of people. It is, you know, I think. It's yeah. important. A couple weeks ago, we were kind of prepping for, for this interview, and, and you wanted to talk about uh, this stage in, in your life when you lost your father, mm-hmm. and it it really switched your, your perspective on, on your own playing and, and sort of the purpose of music in general. Yes. So talk talk about talk about that experience. Uh, sure. Well, you know, before you know there was there was my life before my father passed away, and then there was what happened after, and mm-hmm. I think. You know, before um, you're kind of going through school and music is a vehicle for you Mm -hmm. at that time. You know, it's it's uh, it's something to put all your energy into and you want to get as good as possible. And you really, you know, uh, all these things. I was super, super heady. Mm -hmm. This is about, you know, my mid 20s. I was a super heady player, man. Um, Just overthinking everything and. Uh, it's, it was just, there was, it was no fun. Yeah. Um, and there was no, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of emotion that was going into it, but I was practicing my butt off. <laughs> 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 it, it, so many, it, it was weird putting so many hours in on the drum kit and then getting to the gig and going, what in the world is wrong here? There's something that's not right. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 27, it was, uh, two, yeah, 2006, was 27 years old. And, um, you know, uh, my, my dad goes into the hospital, uh, because, and I'm, I'm pretty open about this. Uh, he, he attempted suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, he, he, had, he had a lot of things. There, there were a lot of things. Beautiful, wonderful man. Mm-hmm. I would not be drumming if it weren't for him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, he was kind of that guy that, you know, you don't want a nine to five job. I hate my nine to five job. <laughs> you should do the music thing, you know? And that, that, that really, you know, to have that support, yeah. I would not be playing today because of him. Um, but he, he, had, he had a lot of things. There were a lot of things on his palate. And yeah, so he, um, he attempts to take his own life. Uh, this was a Thursday, and they they airlifted him to um, Emory, which is right downtown Atlanta, mm-hmm. which is maybe 300, 400 yards from Churchill Grounds. Right. And um, the band Squat that I was playing with at the time, we had, a, uh, we had a weekend. We were supposed to play Churchill Grounds Friday, Saturday. He goes into the hospital Thursday. Okay. So, you know, obviously that wasn't even on my radar. Right. It's like, oh, the, these things are coming. Got to get a sub. Got a sub for Friday. You know, he still hasn't stabilized. And then see Friday night, doctors are like, he's starting to stabilize. Um, you know, he's, he's doing better. Uh, you know, I was like, do I play this gig Saturday, which is right down the road? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was, it was, my, my mom said, it's up to you, um, you know. Decided to play the gig. Mm-hmm. And um, mind you, this is the time of incredible headiness. Yeah. And with all, all of Squat, at that time, Squat, there was a lot of tension in the band. Mm-hmm. You know, just they had been together for, for a while. And it was, that was an insane asylum in itself. <laughs> uh, Trey, Tommy, we can go into that later. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, to... I, you know, I don't remember much about going there, setting up. All I know is that night for two hours, um, it was it was the most zen. Um, no, you know, the, the, I think I ex- I got to experience what like the blues musicians of you know. The, the way earlier on, right. you know, that stuff was coming from their situation. Right. My God, yeah. horrible things. Um, and that was their only escape. And, and that, you know, I was able to take that two hours and put all of those feelings and emotions. And there was no, I didn't feel any, no technical thought. Mm. There was no, it was just music yeah. for the first time ever. And the whole band felt it, you know, they were all there. They're there. And, and, and it was really, beautiful and that was the first time i ever played music at 27 years old um got to experience uh that thing Mm -hmm. and it's you know this this music thing is not about going out there and and going i you know i i sound really good look at me but it's about taking this thing that we're all going through, this life thing, the yeah. great, the bad, the ugly, the all that stuff, yeah. and 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 putting it into the sound that you're making, you mm-hmm. know, make 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 that joyous noise, man. <laughs> um, so it was that was that 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 was the first time, and and still try, you know, try to get to that point night after night, and it's not it's not always there, right. Um, but try to, you know, get digging into those, those emotions and those feelings. Uh, it, that was just, that was a huge lesson. Mm-hmm. And, and you can hear it now. Like there's, you know, there's some young, great, great players coming up on the Atlanta scene that you hear them and you go, man, you are, you, 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 you've, you've got this gift, man, but you've got to go out and you've got to you've got to have some heartbreaks. Mm-hmm. You've got to have all the terrible things that could happen. <laughs> you know, things are going to happen. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's what matures you as a musician. And, and you have something to say then instead of something that's learned and regurgitated from a book or something somebody else played. Um, you really, really coming from somewhere. Yeah. You know? Um. Yeah, but that that was um, that 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 was a tough lesson, um, and uh, but it was that 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 did that that changed everything. It yeah. changed the meaning of music. It, it changed the meaning of of day to day life. 
for me. Yeah, obviously. You know, and but, for, my, for my family. Right. But from, from, from that point on, you just had a new sort of, uh, a new, uh, outlook on, on why you were a musician. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 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 And you know, don't, don't sweat the dumb stuff, mm-hmm. you know, just as a, a day to day thing, you know, it's like we, and, and, and you see how many dark musicians do you see a lot, a lot <laughs> because of their situation, because things haven't turned out the way that they thought they were going to turn out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? We're all really lucky to do what we get to do. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're playing on a wedding band at Sea Island on a, you're lucky, man. Yep. You get to make music, you get paid for it. Um, enjoy it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and when, 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 when my dad, so my dad, after two weeks of being in the hospital did, did pass away. Mm-hmm. So he's not with us anymore. And, uh, I went and spoke with uh, a lady, do uh, you know of Nucci Space in Athens? Mm-mm. So uh, Nucci Space is a community center uh, out in Athens, Georgia, um, that was established as a place for musicians to go for community. Um, this woman, uh, Linda Phillips, her son Nucci uh, committed suicide, um, I, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. I'm not really sure about mm-hmm. that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a place with practice. It's an art center, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but uh, was hooked up with her and went and spoke with her, and she, you know, we're, she, I'm, she wants to hear about my situation, whatnot, and I'm kind of going on about a lot of the things that I felt as a musician, you know, just like my frustrations at that time. I was 27 years old. Things aren't really like in my head; they're one way, but in reality, they're another, right? And she said, "Man." You know, in Eastern philosophy, the biggest thing that brings a balance to one's life is expectations. I just went, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> she said, it's good that you have a goal. You need to have goals, but you, having expectations, like by this time in my life, I should be doing this. Right. That's not, no, that's not the way to go about it. Right. So learning how to, to manage all those, those things, yeah. you know, is, is huge. huge that's part that's of so life. interesting because I think like conflating a goal with an expectation is, is like you said, what, what gets us into trouble? Yes. Like it's, it's okay to have goals, but if you turn it into an expectation, right. You're, you're bound to be disappointed. Yes. Um, because even if it's, even if it's as good as something you imagined, if it's not quite the same, mm-hmm. then it's going to be a disappointment in some way. Yep. So life today is uh, traveling a lot with uh, Colonel Bruce, mm-hmm. and uh, at home, uh, your your wife is a band director for a high school. Yeah, and, she is, and you're running the drum line. I do. Yeah, yeah. So what's what's uh, what's your teaching life like? Man, it's insane. <laughs> um, so she is uh, she's going into her twelfth year. I think this is my eleventh wow. year with the drum line. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my boss is my wife. Good God, on so many levels. She just <laughs> kills me every day. Um, yeah, she is. Uh, it's good for you, man. She, uh, man, I, I, I never met such a go-getter uh, until the day I met Laura Motes. Mm-hmm. Good grief. She's, <laughs> she's crazy. So right, right out of uh, getting her master's at UGA, um, the job, the assistant job came open for Brookwood High School here in Gwinnett County. Mm-hmm. And man, if you grew up in Georgia... You know, you knew about Brookwood High School. I mean, from when I was in school, you know, in high school in the in the '90s, like yeah. Brookwood was a powerhouse, well, huge it's, program. It still is, yeah. um, and it's getting and it's getting more so in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, she's got a band program of about three hundred and fifty, <sighs> three hundred sixty some odd kids. Oh my god! In the marching band, there's two hundred and seventy six this year, I think. Woo. The 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 drum line, um, you know. High school drum line, you know, usually you've got, what, three, four snare drums, a couple. We've got nine snares, <laughs> five tenors, seven bass drums. Seven bass drums? Six, yes, yeah, six cymbals, uh, and uh, oh, 14 wow. in the pit, I think, 13 in the pit. 
and uh, it's ginormous, but we get them to play quality. Right. You know, I feel pretty good about where they're at by the end of the season. It's a it's a task. Yeah. Um, and we also have a, a guy named John Seipert uh, writing. He's written for us for the last eight years. Um, he He's the head of percussion, the drum line out at UGA, and also became caption head at Spirit of Atlanta. Um, this 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 past year, so he's writing for them as well. Wow. Great, great writer. Yeah, very musical, uh, a lot of flow to it, and and the kids love learning it. I love teaching it. You know, yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. So, um, the 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 day to day with you know, they have a little bit different of an experience. I hope, uh, you know, a lot of the big marching band programs the, the 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 powerhouse programs have a drum corps guy that comes in and it's fucking serious man right. you know it's 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 drum corps mentality um just very strict and whatever this is just my view stereotypical view from the outside right um they have to deal with me instead which you know i, I was at elliott street the night before <laughs> right. do, doing coming up you know <laughs> Uh, screaming like a billy goat on stage, you know, I mean, just, just act, acting like a, t- and then going in and so, you know, trying to, to this drumline thing's very important, but also getting the musical side and, and being weird and also getting to, you know, just, just, just being yourself and, and just being a musician. Right. You know, I was, I was going to say, it seems like you, you kind of inject a little bit of, of. The mentality and what, like, what you discovered in your twenties about why you're a musician, like, what is the purpose of music, and Mm -hmm. and you, you know, it sounds like you're able to sort of infuse that into even even into a high school drum line, yeah, you know, which is typically, like you said, kind of militant, kind of overly serious, Uh Um, but uh, so even in a in a in a program that size, um, you know interest of, of, of that many kids doesn't happen by accident. Mm. And even, yeah. you know, even in a, even in a school district with a, a lot of kids and a lot of resources, um, you know, programs have, have changed hands and been taken over by someone else and gone totally downhill. Mm-hmm. So how have, how have you and your wife sort of like maintained interest and how have you kept kids excited and, and maintained, uh, the, the numbers in that program? Um, well, I mean, f- for uh, her energy level is off the charts. You know, and and she she has that balance. All the good teachers that I've had, that you've probably you've had, have that balance of like we're here to get this job done, mm-hmm. but I love you, right? You know, <laughs> that's like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put my foot up, but yeah. uh, but I love you. Yep. You know, there's that there's that. She has a, a good balance of that. Um, now, she just didn't walk into some little school. And it just blew up. Like right. it was, there was a foundation here in 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 this area in Lilburn and Snellville area, where you know the elementary school that's uh, stone throws distance from here is the top elementary school in the state. Wow. Um, all the you know the all the elementary schools, the middle schools, the sense of community out here mm-hmm. uh, is. Is is really amazing. When I first when I first got to to Brookwood and started teaching there too, I saw the um, the mentality of of the kids is different. Hmm. Uh, I taught a lot of different high schools, um, you know, just their band camps or whatever, and the things that you have to deal with, the attitudes, you know, not all the time, but there's always a couple kids in there that you go, man. Why are you here? Right. I got to Brookwood and like I didn't have to yell at anybody. I didn't. Everybody wants to be there. Well, you didn't wonder why any of them were there, right? Yeah. You know, and it, it's just it's. I, I, I kind of went. I didn't know this existed because yeah. I didn't grow up in this. You yeah. know, I didn't either. You know, yeah. It, it's just a. It, it, it's 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 a different thing. Um, the football program here. Uh, I think the last couple of years, a little bit of trouble, but, you know, state champions, 2010, wow. uh, the, the, uh, the baseball is top notch. Soccer is top notch. All the sports are top notch. Yeah. It's just, yeah. you know, um, 
we're, we're, we're lucky where we're at, you know, for our kids to go there. We, we like being here. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you got, you know, 50 kids in the drum line in the pit or something. And, and obviously not all of these kids are going to grow up to be professional drummers. Right. Most of them probably won't even no. mess with it in college. I've seen very few in my 11 years, a kid go on to actually try to want to want to be a full-time musician. Right. You know, right. So how do you, how do you as an educator, um, uh, deal with that because like I as an educator whether I'm in front of a drum line or a private student or whatever like I have a harder time kind of investing in what I'm doing if um, if the students aren't serious uh-huh. you know so h- how do you how do you approach students who you well, know aren't on that track that, that you and I were on in high school okay well I, I, again you know, with, with, with the Brookwood thing, like these kids, for whatever reason, the houses, the homes that they come from, they have been taught that everything they're going to do, they're going to do really well, Mm. you know? So they're not coming in to rehearsal and checking out like they are, they, they are in it with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now as far as teaching kids that, you know, aren't pursuing music as hard as you did. Okay. Uh, I've, I've seen, I try to understand that this thing, this activity that they're doing is not just about the music, but it's also about learning to work with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also about being in a big group, something that's bigger than yourself and everybody having a common goal and putting that whole thing together. And that, that, you know... A lot of these kids that come from Brookwood, I've got a kid that I taught that's that's at Apple doing an intern right now. <laughs> Out, you know, um, these kids go to Duke. They end up going to Georgia Tech. They end up, they end up with you know going out and with very important jobs <laughs> that are not music. And I go, yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. You yeah. know, um, so yeah, just. Um, seeing seeing the bigger picture, mm-hmm. not just going. Yes, these kids are going to be great musicians. They're going to be great drummers. But I just want them to develop, you know, as as human beings. Right. Their you know? their musical experience is going to contribute to them being complete humans. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so important. You yeah. know that the talk of getting rid of the arts and the schools is insane. Yeah, that's I agree. insane talk. I agree. Know? I I just interviewed a a drummer and percussionist who lives in London uh, named Lauren Costi, and and she was talking about how uh, she's only been there a year and a half, but from from what she can see, it's so much more of a priority there than it is here. It's just a given. Like, of course, elementary elementary school kids are going to study music. Like, Mm. of course, they're going to play music. Of course, they're going to sing and play and 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 do all that stuff you know and uh, <laughs> we could get this is a whole other topic but you know greatest country on the earth uh where is that you know where is that mentality coming from um is yeah this country has a lot of great things going for it mm-hmm. but once you get out of the borders yeah go travel yeah okay um that, that's another great thing that music has has helped us with is traveling and getting to see places and meet people that are out of your little bubble, your little zone. Right. I think it's another thing about young musicians. Like when you see a young musician who has a lot of shit together, Uh but like, like you said, he hasn't, he, he or she hasn't, you know, sort of amassed the, the experiences. I think traveling, especially traveling outside the country, is is just essential. <laughs> you, know, yes. um, you know, to to realize that you know the way society is here, there's other ways to do things. Yeah, you know? yeah, um, and you know, America gets a lot of shit right, but we don't get it all right. No, and uh, I think people think that we get a lot more right than than we do. Sure, um, sure. Well, and 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 the arts thing, you know, um, I mean, we are. The, the music that came out of this country, the blues, the yeah. jazz, the, I mean, it changed everything. Yeah. You know, rock and roll is all, it's changed everything. But to go, to go to different countries and see that, you know, um, wow, our, our little, our, our band that isn't gaining a lot of attention in the United States you go to these other European countries and they just embrace you, right? You know, and right. take you in and go. What you do is so important to us. You go, wow, oh, okay. Th- their mentality is a little different. Yeah, so we 
We were in uh, Denmark uh, traveling for a couple of weeks, and can't remember what town we were in. With Delta Moon or with this? Uh, with uh, uh, Delta Moon. Okay. And um, we go, yeah, we were playing, it was like we were playing in an art center. So we're playing in the, um, you know, this auditorium, this art center. And, oh, well, they were telling us this is a school of music. It's a, it's a community school. Okay. Like for what ages? Uh, four up into uh, 18. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Like the, their parents send them there. I mean, is it a lot to go here? No, no, it is. It is. It is free <laughs> for all community children. Like, whoa. Okay. All right. So we start walking around. We go into this room. You know, growing up and in, 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 coming up in the college, did you play in steel band? No. Okay, we we had a steel band at UGA. I did marimba band, which was cool. kind of yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it's a fun little experience to have. You right. know, maybe your only time to do it. Uh, we walk in this room, and there's 25 kids from the age of like seven to 13, with a big room full of. St- steel pans and drum sets and percussion to just, it just was mind boggling. Like, yeah. Look at all this stuff. Look at all this gear. These kids, you know, like the, the instructor's like, Oh, we have musicians from United States here to, to watch you, you know, like they're all excited. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, let's play something for them. So they played um, Margaritaville or something oh like God. that. And they, and I cried, man. Like they, they killed it. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, oh, you know? Wow. And, and it's like, I, I can't, after school program, you know? Right. I mean, so much money invested yeah. in this program. Yeah. And then you walk around the halls, you hear violins coming from everywhere, you hear pianos coming from everywhere. And it's, um, you know, the Denmark, who would have thought? Right. <laughs> uh, Man. And, and yeah, again, so traveling and seeing these other parts of the world is really, really big in it. And, um, you know, get, getting to do that and, and taking those opportunities, I think, is important. Yeah. You know, um, and again, it, it it makes sense that you kind of infuse this experience into into your your teaching. Mm-hmm. Like you 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 know that the musical experience these kids are having are are not going to lead to a career, but they're going to lead to a wholeness of, yeah. of self. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's uh, it it does that the music is good for the brain. Yeah, you know, uh, and 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 again, you know, being being a father and seeing firsthand like what, you know, what what my musical realm has encompassed, and look at my kids and go, hmm, well, uh, should you be a full time musician when you grow up? I mean, if you have to do it, <laughs> then you do it, right? But if you don't, if, if there's not a gun to your back and you're not like you, your, your whole being doesn't say don't do it, then don't do it. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Man. You know, there's a lot of other things that, that, that you could do. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, what, what are we all doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. Just trying to get through, man. Just trying to get through. It, we, 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 we have we have there's some need. There's some need to express ourselves. Through this thing, yeah, it's weird. There was a I, f- I forgot who I was talking to or who said it, but some somebody's mentor or he, he saw somebody give a clinic or something. God, I wish I could remember who this was. But he said, uh, if if there's anything you can do other than music, if there's anything uh-huh. you're you're at all inclined yep. to do for a living, yeah. go do it. Go do that. <laughs> You should only do music if you have to. If you have to. Yeah. You've got a gun to your back. Right. Hey, get, go to back to Bruce for a second. Yeah. Uh, you know, his huge, big thing. So before him, you know, really starting to getting together and, and write with, with people and, you know, trying to write songs with other folks and having the mentality of like, what, what would be popular? What would, what would get played on the radio? What would, blah, you know, those types of mentality, you hear it everywhere. Mm-hmm. People want to make money off of this thing, mm-hmm. you know, and be part of the huge music industry juggernaut that is today. Um, but 
Bruce pulls it back to what is your intent? Mm-hmm. Why are you in this thing? You know, are you here, you know, to really express yourself and to, but are you here to get chicks? <laughs> are you here to rock? Are you here to be in front of a bunch of people? Do you want everybody to bow down to you? Yes. You know, or, or, or is there a deeper thing, mm-hmm. you know, and man, he sees it pretty quickly in people, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and being around that, I, I, I'm, I'm start, starting to see those things mm-hmm. too. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Why did we all get in this thing in the first place? And when you grow older and money becomes more important, you know, are you going to go down that route? Yeah. You know, yeah. or, um, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that it, it reminds me of something of, uh, Something John Schofield said. I, I saw him do a performance uh, when I was in Kansas City, and and before the performance, he did like a Q and A interview type thing, and and took some questions. And I've loved John Schofield forever, and I think his compositions are so cool and like a perfect balance between you know being artistic and unique, but also being like so funky and accessible and whatever. So I asked him about his composition. I was like, do you do you intentionally? ride that line of, of making something artistic, but also making it accessible or making it, uh, something that'll be popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he, he said, no, I, I do what feels good to me. I do what sounds good to me. And if you write and if you play, um, with that sort of honesty, like this is what I want to do. This is what I need to do. And this is what I want to put forward. Mm -hmm. Then it'll, it'll be received well. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you present it, um, um, you know, honestly, authentically, then it'll be received, uh, favorably. Yeah. What is your intent? Yeah. You know, and, um, playing with different groups, you, 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 you start to see that, you know, yeah. and, and I, I, man, that I, I try not to be on, on, on stage with, with false, with, with, mm. with fake, with, um, you know, be who you are, not uh, not some facade, not an illusion, mm-hmm. um, but really, really, really come from an authentic place, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's that that's 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 sometimes a tough thing. P- people just want to be admired. They want to be big stars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Ah, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I I think we've uh, we've reached a place of uh, of wisdom and profundity here. <laughs> I think the voices are getting very serious and low. <laughs> and I think we should quit while we're ahead. Good. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking. Man. Yeah, sure. It was a blast. Love that talk with Darren. He has such clear ideas and, and he can express them without hesitation. Uh, and it's it's exactly the same way on the drums. It's really a beautiful thing to, to see and hear. Uh, there's some video of his playing on the page for this episode at workingdrummer.net. I highly recommend you check him out. You can see those hands we were talking about and uh, just how solid and balanced he is as a player after all that new breed work. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, post pics of your drumming adventures using the hashtag Working Drummer. Uh, and if you have the chance to hip someone to this podcast and help us grow our audience, we appreciate that. Thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance, and as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.